<clears throat> Welcome to today's Oxford COVID Conversations. Uh, we're going to talk today about the vaccine initiatives being undertaken in Oxford and uh, further afield. We're extremely lucky to be joined today by uh, Sarah Gilbert, who is the project lead for the Oxford uh, COVID-19 vaccine trial. Uh, and Sarah works at the Jenner Institute, which for 20 years and more has been uh, specializing in vaccine development. Uh, particularly in the field of global health. And uh, Sarah particularly has taken an interest in the area of emerging infections. Of course, uh, COVID-19 is the latest of a series of emerging infections, which is having enormous impact worldwide. Um, so it's in incredibly helpful that she's come here to talk to us about it today. And I know she's very busy. Um, during the conversation, uh, she will um, present uh, an update of uh, the design of the trial and previous work that led to them being in a position to, to be able to do the trial and what the impact of the trial might be. But I, I, I would like to uh, uh, remind you that she won't be able to talk about the uh, uh, emerging data coming from the trial because that's clearly locked down until uh, the, uh, the trial is able to report, which should be in quite a small number of weeks from now. So she'll not be able, I'm afraid, to answer your questions about whether the vaccine is working yet, because none of us at this point knows. Um, please bear with us if we have difficulties uh, in the uh, continuity of the stream, because many of us are working from home or elsewhere at the moment. Um, and, and so there may be some interruptions to your, to your, uh, to your service. Um, so with that, if I might turn to Sarah, welcome, Sarah. Um, thank, you. thank you very much for giving your time this afternoon. Um, please uh, tell us what has been the, the single biggest challenge in getting the Oxford trial uh, rolling as fast as you've been able to do it. Well, I think the biggest challenge for me initially was raising the funding to do it because all this work needs money. And that's the, we had a little bit of money and the project grew and then we needed more money and more money. And um, we have now been successful in, in getting funding and we now have a commercial partner. And so that's no longer the main concern. I think the concern at the moment is that we are doing a lot of vaccine development work, which we're very familiar with in Oxford. And we've done all of this before, but we're doing it in a much shorter time scale than we normally would. So rather than um, being able to uh, deal with one part of the project and review it and then consider moving on to the next. It's actually doing everything in parallel uh, and moving from planning phase three trials back to talking about manufacturing all in the same day. So there's a lot of things going on. As I said, none of it is, is particularly new to us. We're just not used to doing it all at the same time. Amazing work. Well, thank you. So we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. So I'll share my slides now. And you should now be able to see the, the first slide with the COVID Conversations logo on it. So I'm going to talk to you today about the preclinical and clinical development of CHADOX-1 NCOV-19. So CHADOX-1 being the viral vector that we use to make this vaccine, the so-called platform technology, and I'll explain how that works. Uh, NCOV-19 um, being the novel coronavirus 19 now known as, known as SARS-CoV-2, but it didn't have that name when we started this project, and of course causes the disease now known as COVID-19. And this is a collaboration between multiple groups within Oxford. I'm based in the Jenner Institute, which is part of the Department of Medicine, and we're working very closely on this project with the Oxford Vaccine Group, which is part of the Department of Pediatrics. Um, and we often collaborate, but this is the first time I think we've worked together on such a large scale, forming the COVID-19 Oxford Vaccine Trial Group to deliver this project. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the technology that we're using, CHADOX-1. So um, it's a non-replicating simian adenoviral vector vaccine. And let me explain what all the parts of that description mean. It's an adenovirus. Adenoviruses are viruses that cause um, mild illnesses in humans, upper respiratory tract infections, sometimes um, gastrointestinal infections, uh, short-lived. Um, we don't usually need to vaccinate people against adenovirus infections. They're one of the causes of the common cold. Uh, they're not very serious infections, but they are viruses that can infect human cells. And we can make use of that property and, and use it to make a vaccine. 
So we have a non-replicating viral vector. That means that the live vaccine that we produce can infect cells after vaccination, but then inside that cell, it can't make any more copies of itself, which is what a live adenovirus would normally do. Normally a virus will infect a cell, use that cell to make lots more copies of itself, and then from there spread to other cells in the body and the infection would grow. But when we have a non-replicating vaccine vector, it's not able to do that. It just infects the first cell it gets into. And what it does then is produce the antigen that we want to get the immune response to. And so that antigen in this case is the spike protein taken from the coronavirus. So we have taken the gene that encodes the coronavirus spike protein, and we've put it into the genome of this replication deficient adenovirus, so that it now acts as a vaccine against the coronavirus. And we use a simian adenovirus, so that's one that was originally isolated from a monkey. And that is because people don't have pre-existing immunity to this particular monkey adenovirus. We, it is possible to use human adenoviruses to make vaccine vectors in the same way. And they work really well in animals that don't, get norm, don't normally get infected with human adenoviruses. But if we have humans who've been infected with human adenoviruses and they have antibodies to them as a result of that infection, that reduces the ability of the vaccine vector to induce a good immune response in those people. Uh, and so it's not such a good strategy. So... Um, we know that with this type of vaccine, we can make it fairly quickly. We can manufacture it at large scale and very, very controlled conditions, which is what we require for making a vaccine. And when we use it as a vaccine, it's safe because it can't replicate. It can't spread through the body after infection. So even if somebody's not able to make an immune response because they're very severely immunocompromised, for example, this would not be a dangerous thing to a dangerous vaccine to give them. It's not going to cause an infection that would cause them any harm but it does induce very strong immune responses when we use it as a vaccine. Now, before April of this year, we'd used this type of vaccine technology in 12 different clinical trials, phase one studies using antigens taken from different pathogens, most of them viral, um, and all of those have been approved by the ethical and regulatory bodies for those trials to be initiated. And up to April, we'd vaccinated 330 healthy adults with different Chadox-1 vector vaccines. But there are other CHADs out there. There's CHAD3, there's CHAD63. These have been used in malaria vaccine development and TB vaccine development and HIV as well. And so altogether, this type of vaccine technology has been used in well over 6,000 subjects of all ages. In the malaria vaccine trials, very young infants have been vaccinated. And in the flu vaccine trials, which I was running, uh, we've vaccinated people over the age of 80. So we know a lot about the safety and the immune response. We know that the dose of the vaccine determines the side effects that we see, and it's not really related to the antigen that we're being expressed. So that helps us decide what dose we should use straight away when we want to start a new vaccine project. And we can also use it to develop veterinary vaccines. So this is one example of a, a, a vaccine project that was running um, prior to the beginning of the year. This is a vaccine against Rift Valley fever virus. Now, Rift Valley fever is a virus which is transmitted by mosquito species, but lots of different mosquito species, and it can exist in their eggs. Um, so in a period of drought, the eggs can live in the ground, and then when the rains come, the eggs hatch into um, infected mosquitoes, which then go and bite animals that have come to eat the grass that's grown after the rain. Um, and these infected animals will then spread the Rift Valley fever virus around between themselves, and they can also infect the people who are looking after those animals. Now, this is a disease that's really economically important in Africa. It doesn't infect older ad it doesn't affect older adults very significantly, but in young animals, there's quite a high mortality rate. And the main effect is that um, you see abortion storms in flocks of sheep. So the sheep will all lose their lambs, and this can have a really um, drastic economic effect on the farmer because suddenly they have no lambs being born that year. Um, it can be transmitted to humans as well and the case fatality rate is about 30% and it can leave lifelong effects if people recover from the infection. So Chadox-1 expressing the Rift Valley fever surface antigen has been tested in all of these species in, in people, sheep, cattle um, and goats and um, so the clinical trials will be starting quite soon uh, this is run by my colleague, uh, George Wurimway, who works in Kenya now. And he's also shown that a single dose of the vaccine is protective against infection, deliberate infection in sheep, cattle and goats. And that if you immunize camels, you get a very strong immune response as well. So this looks to be a really 
good One Health vaccine, where the same vaccine seed stock could be used to produce vaccines to protect the animals and stop the economic losses, but also to protect the people who are likely to be coming into contact with those infected animals and prevent outbreaks and prevent the disease from spreading any further. We've also used it in a series of other vaccine um, programs. So I was the first person to use Chalux-1 in clinical studies, and that was as a flu vaccine. And that was looking at the boosting of existing T cell responses against influenza. Um, it's been used in a TB vaccine study, um, again, looking at um, T inducing T cell responses against tuberculosis uh, in this study that was published in uh, earlier this year. And it's been used um, to make a vaccine against chikungunya, which is another emerging infection. Um, and my colleague Arturo Reis Sandoval has been uh, leading on the chikungunya vaccine development. So all using the same technology, the same way of making the vaccine, of manufacturing the vaccine and generating safety and immunogenicity data, which is then useful to us when we want to make a new vaccine uh, against an emerging infection, which is what we are now doing. And another vaccine that I was working on was a vaccine against Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And this is important because this is another coronavirus. So MERS um, is a disease that is now endemic in camels across the Middle East. It hasn't always been the case. It probably originated in bats in Africa and appears to have then transmitted into camels. And there's a lot of trading in camels between the Horn of Africa and the Middle East. And what appears to have happened about 30 or 40 years ago is that some camels who were infected with the MERS virus were imported into the Middle East. And from there, the disease has spread. And now very many camels are, across the Middle East are infected. It doesn't cause a very severe disease in the camels. They have a really mild cold-like infection, but it can be quite easily transmitted to humans because it turns out that the receptor this particular coronavirus uses to enter cells, which is DPP4 on the surface of cells, is very, very similar between camels and humans. So a virus that can spread between camels and cause infections will also transmit to humans. And we now know that in young and healthy adults, it again causes a fairly mild disease. And we see that people who work with camels sometimes have antibodies against MERS coronavirus, even though they don't report disease. But in older adults, people with diabetes, with some degree of immune compromise, for example, we see severe and chronic infections. And there have been more than 800 deaths in 20 seven countries. There was a large outbreak in South Korea, which infected uh, four different hospitals uh, and cost the economy a very large amount of money to contain. So this is one of the priority diseases for vaccine development chosen by the WHO. And as with the, the vaccine that we're now making against um, SARS-CoV-2, the major surface antigen is the spike protein. So we took the gene that encodes the spike protein in the coronavirus, put it into Chalux-1, made a vaccine and started to test it. And we did some preclinical testing in animal models, but we've also done a clinical trial, the results of which have now been published. And a summary of these results are shown on the slide. So at the top, we're looking at the antibody responses against the MERS coronavirus at different times after vaccination. And one thing that's interesting is that even before vaccination, there are four people in this study who had some low level responses which cross reacted with the MERS spike protein. And this is probably because there were four other human coronaviruses that regularly circulate and infect people and cause a cold like illness, sometimes more severe in older people, but generally not diagnosed as any particular type of viral infection. And some of those coronavirus sequences are quite similar to MERS. And so that's why we have these low level cross reactive responses. The majority of people don't have them, though. And when we vaccinate them with the Chalux-1 MERS vaccine, we see an increase in the antibody responses, which peaks four weeks after vaccination and then begins to decline a little bit. But they're still maintained at above the level it was pre-vaccination a year after these people have been vaccinated. And we can look at the T cell responses as well. And again, there are some low level responses before we vaccinate. T cell responses tend to peak 14 days after vaccination. It's earlier than the antibody responses. And then they decline as well. But then they reach this plateau level and they're maintained at that level until the point where we ended the study a year after vaccination. So this is important in thinking about vaccination against SARS-CoV-2, because we know that with the coronavirus spike protein in Chadox-1, we can induce antibody responses, we can induce T cell responses, and they're well maintained. And we also get neutralizing antibody responses. So these are 
antibodies that can bind the live virus and prevent it from entering a cell. Uh, and in this study, we looked at three different dose levels of the Chalix-1 MERS vaccine, and we found that with the higher dose, more of the people produced neutralizing antibodies. And that was key in defining what we were going to do in the new um, SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus vaccine trial, because we decided we would go ahead straight away just with the high dose, instead of spending time testing different dose levels. We already know that the vaccine is safe to use at all three doses, but we get the strongest immune responses when we give the highest of the doses that we tested in this study. So for the coronavirus trial, we're not testing multiple doses initially, although we are going to go on to look at a number of different doses during the course of the clinical trials. So looking at um, the, the T cell responses against the um, SARS coronavirus protein, again, we see an increase um, uh, after vaccination and good maintenance of the responses after a year. But when we started to think about the, the new vaccine, the need to make a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, one of the problems that people brought up, or one of the potential problems, is the potential immunopathology, which was seen in early vaccine development against the original SARS virus. So what happened then is that um, when the SARS outbreak happened some 20 years or so ago, um, people started to develop vaccines by growing large quantities of the SARS coronavirus, inactivating it, and then using that as a vaccine with an alum adjuvant. And what happened in some uh, preclinical studies is that when animals were vaccinated with that type of vaccine and then exposed to the SARS, the SARS virus to see if they were protected, they actually had worse disease after exposure to the virus than animals which had not been vaccinated. Um, and this is a phenomenon which has been seen previously in human vaccine studies in the 1960s and 70s with respiratory syncytial virus development in children, the same kind of phenomenon have been seen. So it's a great concern that if you're going to make a vaccine that actually makes the disease worse, you need to understand why that's happening. And you need to understand that if you're going to make a successful vaccine, you have to have something that does something that works in a very different way. So we need to understand the immune response that causes immunopathology. And the studies from the original SARS trials showed that they have a so-called Th2 skewed immune response. Uh, they had uh, infiltration of their lungs of a particular type of cell called eosinophils, and there was also antibody-dependent enhancement of infection. And this means that when there are low levels of antibodies present after the vaccination, these bound to the SARS virus and actually assisted the virus in getting inside cells and made the infection worse. And so this is the type of thing that we don't want to see when we're developing a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so what we need to look for in the, in the early studies, in the preclinical studies, is firstly the induction of neutralizing antibodies. These are the antibodies that bind to the virus and prevent it infecting cells, rather than assisting it in, in infecting the cells. We want to look for a Th1 type response rather than a Th2 response. And we want to see if in the preclinical studies there is any evidence of enhanced disease after vaccination and challenge. And we assess that by looking at the clinical scores of the animals. So how well are they? after they've been vaccinated and then challenged. We measure the virus titers in the lungs, looking at um, a radiographic study of the lungs of infected animals to ensure that they are not uh, more affected in the vaccinated animals. And we look for histopathology following um, the end of the study. So that's taking individual tissues from the lung uh, and staining them to look for presence of the virus, to look for infiltration of eosinophils or any other um, types of immune cells uh, and, and generally making sure that the picture we're seeing is a vaccine-mediated protection and not vaccine-mediated enhanced disease. So the preclinical studies that we need to do before the vaccine trial are really important, not really for looking at how well the vaccine works. What they're all about is looking at, is this a safe type of vaccine to use? Is this giving us the right type of immune response and not the wrong type of immune response? So we started to do some studies uh, much earlier on in the year. And the first part of this was to immunize some mice and look at the antibody induction. So remember that we want to see neutralizing antibodies induced because that didn't happen in, in the wrong type of vaccine. Uh, and that's shown here. So when we immunize different strains of mice, um, either the inbred mice or the outbred mice, we can measure antibodies that bind um, the first part of the S protein, the spike, 
or the second part of the spike protein, but we also see neutralizing antibodies are induced in both strains of mice. So this is, this is the first um, indication that we are definitely getting the right kind of immune response. And I said that we needed a, a response that was Th2 more than, sorry, Th1 rather than Th2. And you can assess that by looking at the different cytokines that are produced by the immune cells after vaccination. And here we are seeing interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and this is indicative of a Th1 response. So again, all indication is that it's the right type of immune response and not the one that makes the disease worse. But we can't test a vaccine challenge in mice. They're not susceptible to the virus. Um, so we have to do that in non-human primates. And this was done in a collaboration with NIH at the Rocky Mountain Labs in Montana. And again, they look for um, induction of antibodies after vaccination. And so the control group in the blue squares here have no antibodies, but the red circles, which have received the vaccine, develop antibodies after vaccination that you can measure in an ELISA assay. And also they develop neutralizing antibodies again that we can measure in the virus neutralization assay. So again, the right type of immune response. And we're seeing T cells induced, which is again, the right type of immune response. And these animals were then exposed to a really high dose of SARS-CoV-2 um, in a challenge method, which involves dropping virus inoculum directly down the trachea, so it infects the, the lungs directly. They also get virus put into their nose, the mouth, and the eyes. Uh, so this is a very high dose challenge, uh, and it's looking to see for looking for any evidence that we are seeing um, enhancement of disease um, after the vaccination. Uh, has taken place. Um, and fortunately, the result was that there is definitely no enhancement of disease, and we are seeing a reduction in the virus in the lungs rather than an increase. So looking at the clinical scores from the animals, this is um, how they behave, how well they move, how much food they're eating, and so on. We're seeing that in the control group, the blue bars, we see higher clinical scores on every day than we do with the, the red bars. Now, in this study where we're doing um, lavage of the lungs um, three times during the study and the animals were anesthetized um, prior to being given the, the viral infection, some of these study procedures will result in, um, in clinical scores, which we're counting here. So it's not all due to the virus infection, but the same procedures are used in all the animals. And we're seeing that the, um, the red bars here, the vaccinated animals, are um, certainly suffering less than the than the blue bars, the high, the um, control vaccinated animals. And in fact, all of this is indicating quite mild disease. These scores are low in any case. And the um, monkeys who are being vaccinated and then infected don't suffer a very severe disease, but we're reducing the clinical scores by the use of the vaccine. And then looking in the lavage fluid, so if you wash out, of the, wash out the lungs and look for evidence of virus replication in the lungs on day three, five, and seven after um, introducing the virus challenge, we can see there's a small amount of um, RNA, viral RNA, in one of the vaccinated monkeys out of the group of six, but um, much higher titers in the control um, animals. And in fact, when we look with a different assay, which measures um, live virus, evidence of viral replication, rather than the whole um, RNA, which could be indicating dead virus, which was a carryover from the challenge, when we look for evidence of viral replication, we see no viral re replication in the lungs of any of the vaccinated animals. So despite putting a large amount of virus directly into their lungs, three days later, none of that virus has caused an infection and been able to replicate. However, what we don't see is any difference in the amount of virus that's in their nose. So these were infected in the nose and the mouth and the eye, as well as the lungs. And if we measure the virus um, from nose swabs, uh, on the third day after introducing the virus, we can see that we definitely do have virus replicating there uh, in both the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated animals, but actually in all of them, um, by day seven after challenge, this has finished. So although there's a short-lived viral infection in the upper respiratory tract after this very high dose exposure, it's all over by day seven and there's no continued um, shedding of the virus from the nose here. Looking at the lung tissues, um, we can see very little um, evidence of viral replication in any of the lung tissues. Uh, I think this was one monkey that had it in two parts of the lung and the remainder were completely clear. So despite this very high dose challenge, defined, which is designed to look at the safety, uh, we're able to see that the vaccine is having 
uh, an effective response of protecting the lower respiratory tract, it's preventing infection in the lungs, it's preventing pneumonia. Um, with this particular model, we don't see any impact on the nasal shedding, but that doesn't mean that if we were to do a more physiological challenge, exposing the, um, the nose of the monkeys to the, the level of virus that you might expect to be exposed to as a person um, getting infected, there might be a different outcome that has not yet been tested. So with the safety data um, very clearly demonstrated, we were able to start our clinical study. Our first phase one trial of this vaccine started on the 23rd of April. And this is quite a large study for a phase one trial. Normally we'd have fewer people than this. Um, but one of the reasons it's particularly large is that right from the beginning of the phase one trial, half the participants receive the coronavirus vaccine and the other half receive a different vaccine, which in this case is a meningitis vaccine. And this is because uh, we are going to be following these subjects and looking not only at the safety of the vaccine and the ability to reduce immune responses, we're also looking to see if the vaccine protects them. Um, and in order to do that, we need a control group who haven't had the vaccine, but they have had another vaccine, so they don't know which vaccine they've had. And all of the subjects in this trial and in the subsequent trials will be asked that if they have symptoms of coronavirus infection, they come and get a PCR test so we can very quickly diagnose them. And that will happen over time. And as we vaccinate more people in the later studies, they will all come to be diagnosed if they have any symptoms of coronavirus. And we will gradually accumulate numbers of cases. And when the numbers of cases have become large enough to indicate that there might be uh, enough to find out if the vaccine's working, then the statisticians will have a look at the data and they'll find out if the infections were in the meningitis group or also in the um, Chaddox 1 and COP19 group. And obviously we hope that all the infections are going to turn out to be in the meningitis group, but we have to wait un until the answer when we have enough data to find out what's going on in this study. Now, most of the people in this study only received one dose of the vaccine, which is what we did in the first MERS trial that we did, but a small number will receive two doses four weeks apart. And that's because we don't know how strong the immune response needs to be to protect anybody against coronavirus. We know that when we gave the MERS vaccine as a single dose, we saw good antibody responses and good T cell responses, but we don't know if those responses are enough, or they may be more than we need. We don't know that either. So in order to look at um, the possibility of inducing higher immune responses, a small number of people will receive two doses of the vaccine, and we'll look at that, what that does for their immune response. We'd expect to see a higher uh, immune response after two doses. So we started that study at the end of April and a month later, we were able to start the next phase of the study, but was in fact two next phases, a phase two and a phase three trial. So what phase two means is that we're expanding the age range of the people that we're including in these studies. So the first trial was in adults aged between 18 and 55, but clearly we want to be able to know how well the vaccine works in older people because most of the, the, the fatalities and most of the severe disease is in people over the age of 70. Uh, so we don't want a vaccine that's only tested in young and healthy people. But that's where we always start with vaccine trials. So having spent the first four weeks immunizing the people under the age of 55, we were then able to move on to another group of people aged between 56 and 69, who also receive a single dose of the vaccine, followed by another group which is aged over 70. And these vaccinations have recently started. And so we will be able to look at the immune response in these different age groups because what normally happens with vaccines is that the older you get, the less strong an immune response you make to any given vaccine. This is a particular problem with flu vaccines. And so there are some flu vaccines which are given at higher doses to older people to try to counter this problem. And there are some flu vaccines which have an adjuvant added. So we are starting to assess this in parallel with looking at the efficacy of the vaccine in all of these age groups. Uh, and it may be that if we find an immune response that's good enough in younger people to protect them, we might have to give the older people either a higher dose or a second dose to achieve the same level of immune response. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking for. And um, later on in the year, we will also look at testing the vaccine in some children as well to, to find out the right dose to use in children. But we won't do this until we've got a lot of safety data coming from the adults that have been included in the study. And then the other phase of the study that started is a phase three trial. So this involves immunizing a large number of people and we're aiming for 10,000 people in total in this study, 
half of them have the coronavirus vaccine and half of them have meningitis. And these were the ones with the larger numbers. And we're prioritizing healthcare workers here, people who are more likely to be exposed to coronavirus infection. Uh, and from this group, we hope to be able to see the vaccine working. Um, but that's going to depend on how much virus transmission there is. Uh, and obviously, since we went into lockdown in March, the amount of virus transmission has reduced quite significantly. And that's a really great thing for the population as a whole. But it unfortunately, it gives us a problem with testing vaccine efficacy. That if nobody's getting infected, we can't tell if the vaccine's working. So for that reason, we're also starting to work with clinical trial units in other countries. And Brazil has now announced um, a trial that they're going to be running. There's a lot of virus transmission in Brazil at the moment. Uh, and with that trial running and potentially some other countries joining in as well, we hope to have a better opportunity to assess vaccine efficacy as well as safety and immunogenicity. But it's still not possible to say when we're going to know if this vaccine works because it all depends on having enough people in the trials becoming infected before we can um, say if it's working or not. Uh, so it's dependent on the virus transmission in the countries where we're doing the clinical trials. Uh, and I know everybody wants to know when that's going to be. Um, and William said that we were going to have some data in, in about a month to publish. That won't be on the vaccine efficacy. That will be on the safety, the reactogenicity, um, or you know, how the vaccine affects people that it's given to, uh, and what the immune responses look like in the first people in the phase one study. Um, and we're all waiting to see how, many, um, how long it takes to get the infections in the control group that we need to know if the vaccine's working. And I'd love to be able to tell you the answer, but um, none of us have any control over that. So um, we now have licensed the vaccine to AstraZeneca for further development. Uh, and they are going to help us accelerate the development and production, particularly the large scale production of this vaccine so that it can be supplied to the world. And they now have commitments to make 2 billion doses of the vaccine using manufacturers in different countries. They're not going to take any profit during the pandemic. Um, they are going to um, supply the ongoing um, uh, clinical trials. They will support uh, the clinical trials that we will now be working on in Brazil and potentially in other countries as well. And then Af AstraZeneca will take over with a further phase three trial to be run in the US slightly later in the year. And they will be responsible for the large scale manufacturing of the vaccine, which has already been started up, even though we don't know if the vaccine works yet, because we don't want to be in a position later in the year where we discover that the vaccine does work, but we don't have any of it to be able to use to immunize people. So that manufacturing is proceeding at risk even though we don't know if we have an effective vaccine yet, so that we hope to be able to ready to deploy the vaccine once we have the efficacy result. And I'd just like to finish by acknowledging the many, many types of people who've been important in getting this work started and running and continuing. And there are far, far too many people to give individuals names, so I'm not going to even attempt to do that. I've just put on this slide the, the sorts of people that have been working with us on the manufacturing, on the um, project management of the clinical trials, of, of delivering the clinical trials, and looking at the immunology of the clinical trials, helping us with the preclinical immunology so that we could get the safety data we needed to start the trials. And, and most importantly, of course, the clinical trial volunteers who have come forward uh, and, and volunteered to take part in this study. And we're very grateful for their, um, for their role in all of this. So I'll finish there and I'll take any questions which I think William's going to coordinate. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was an incredibly impressive tour de force. And of course, you provoked vast numbers of questions. I'm going to try and try and shepherd into some uh, some logical sequence for you. Um, I, I think um, one thing that just strikes me is the speed with which you've managed to get to where you are now with several different preclinical animal models and the phase one trial going since the end of April and the phase two and three already already starting up. Yeah. Is, is that... Is that a record? I think it probably is to go from um, identifying a virus to being in a phase three trial. I think that that must be a record. I mean, yeah. it's not something that's that's happened in isolation. And that's why I wanted to tell you about the work that we've done leading up to this, because some people have been concerned that we're going too fast and that it won't oh. be safe. But what what you need to understand is that what we're doing now is building on years of work. Mm. We've used this type of vaccine technology, as I said, in many clinical trials. Uh, the most closely related is the MERS corona vaccine 
clinical trial. So we know how to make the vaccine. We know the safety of the vaccine. We know the, what we expect to see in terms of the immune responses. Mm -hmm. So all of that groundwork has meant that we've been able to go quickly. And I've also been working with, with my colleagues to think about how you assess these new vaccines. What preclinical studies do you need to do before you can start your clinical trials? What questions are the regulators going to ask so we can be ready to address those so that we don't have to go away and do two months further work before we're given permission to start the trials? So um, it's not something that's happened on its own. It builds on a very large body of work which has happened previously. Oh, it's, it's very impressive. Now, in spite of all that, there are quite understandable, a lot of questions coming about the tempo of everything. So I'm going to take the tempo ones first of all, if you like. Um, so just break it down a little bit. So the phase one results, you, you've got a reasonable idea of when those are going to be coming out. Can you just remind us the, so that's, the, that's essentially the safety side of things with a little bit of... Uh, so, so the phase, yeah, phase one is safety, vaccine, reactogenicity. Do people have a sore arm after infection? Do they have a fever? Those kind of things. And as I said, um, we've used this technology a lot before and we know what we expect to see. Uh, but also in the phase one trial, we're looking for immunogenicity. We're measuring immune responses right from the beginning. Um, and the, the first data that we will be able to share uh, probably in about a month from now will be on the, the safety and the immunogenicity in the phase one trial. Although all of the subjects in the phase one trial are also part of the efficacy testing process, but we won't have any we won't have any data on efficacy from the no. phase one trial. They will combine with the phase two and the phase three trial participants. We will continue to follow all of them. But the first results will be on the, the safety and the immune responses. That's 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 very, very clear. So then people are asking about when will we know about the phase two and three? I know you've, you've answered this, but just <laughs> just to, just to, to, to clarify the, the conditions which need to be satisfied before you can report. And that, that'll give people an idea of, um, uh, of the time. So, so in all of the trials, the phase one, the phase two, the phase three, half of the participants get the coronavirus vaccine and half of them get a meningitis vaccine and they don't know which. And they do whatever they normally do. And, and in the phase two and the phase three, most of them are hospital workers, healthcare workers. And those jobs do involve uh, being exposed to coronavirus potentially as people go about their, their work. Um, and what we need is to have a diagnosis, so PCR positive diagnosis of coronavirus infection in sufficient numbers of people who are enrolled in the trial to then break the code and see which vaccine they had. And if we see that half of them got coronavirus and half of them got meningitis vaccine, then it didn't give them any protection. But if they're all in the meningitis vaccine group and none of them in the coronavirus vaccine group, then we've got a highly effective virus. And the, the, what will actually happen is probably going to be somewhere in between those two extremes because these things usually work that way. Yeah. And it's a question of how, how far, you know, have we got very few cases in the coronavirus group and almost all of them in meningitis. And the statisticians say that we need about 30 people to be affected, infected before they're happy to go and have a look at the data and, and tell us what the answer is. And so of course, we the case numbers are dropping off so fast now that it's really a challenge, yes. isn't it? Yes, transmission is very low in the UK now. So it may take some considerable time to get there, which is why it's important to start trials in other countries. The Brazil one, fantastic, absolutely. Yes. Very, very so good. there, there's a very good clinical trial unit that can do really high quality research, but also in a country with high transmission. So that gives us a better opportunity. Yeah, that's great. Um, there were some questions about that, which is actually quite an interesting sort of industrial question about how you go about scaling up the production of, of clinical quality material and uh, to, to actually roll out, let's say it all works. How long would it take to, this, let's say the phase three gives you get a tick. How long would it then take to generate enough doses to be actually rolling it out into the public health systems? So the aim um, from AstraZeneca is to have um, 30 million doses manufactured, um, I believe by September. <laughs> I'm trying to remember their, their figures yeah, and, then, right, yeah. and then more than that by the end of the year. So that works happening now. So obviously yeah. we have the vaccine manufactured um, for our clinical studies. But it's we're now working with a consortium of manufacturers who can work at much larger scale. And the first GMP quality run at 200 litres has happened now. So wow. that's the that that is underway. Um, obviously, um, it takes some 
time for all of the manufacturers to, to get everything up and running and test the processes and, and, and start to manufacture, but that's beginning to happen now. Amazing. So between now and um, September, the aim is to get 30 million doses ready to go, but, but to keep going, that, that's certainly not where it's going to finish. Right. Um, working with other manufacturers in other countries as well. Manu AZ will do manufacturing in the US and they're working with manufacturers um, in other countries. Uh, Serum Institute of India are now going to right. um, take part and they can do very, very large scale manufacturing. So right. between all of the different manufacturers, there, there should be a very large supply available. That's very good. And it's quite unusual, isn't it, that they're proceeding at risk in a way, that they're, they're scaling up to this industrial level before we have the readouts of any efficacy? Yes. I mean, this, this isn't unknown. Okay. Um, when, when Sanofi Pasteur were developing their dengue vaccine, they also invested in manufacturing facilities for that in right. parallel with their phase three trials, right. because they, they had the same situation. They didn't want to have a, a dengue vaccine, which they wanted to start using, and then have to about building manufacturing facilities. Yeah. What's particularly unusual here is that the manufacturing scale up started in parallel with phase one. Yeah, I don't yeah, think absolutely. that's not normal, but then we went from phase one to phase three in a month. So it, it, it's only a month earlier. Now I'm gonna try and find the person who asked this question because it, it, it um, oh dear, it's so hard to find the names. Um, somebody, it relates to that, you, you, you were, uh, you, you on Andrew Marr's show some, some time ago, you, you mm -hmm. predicted 80% certainty that um, uh, that uh, that this was going to be successful. And of course, it's that percentage of success that kind of makes the bet by the AstraZeneca of this world mm -hmm. uh, sensible. Do you still feel the same way? I will try and find the name of the person in a minute, but uh, says Okay, so it wasn't on the Andrew Marr show. It was a journalist who asked me in a very ah. rushed interview and mm -hmm. insisted that I gave a percentage of, of yes. how likely what it was to work um well um and then we didn't discuss any further what work means uh but basically the 80 percent comes from the fact that i think this type of, of vaccine technology has a very high chance of producing a successful vaccine how long it will take to get the answer i can't say because as we've talked about it depends on the amount of virus um and exactly what it takes i mean do we need to give one dose? Do we need to give two doses? Quite, quite. That needs to be defined, and we're looking at that. But you know, I, I still think because this type of vaccine gives you strong antibody responses, neutralizing antibodies, T cell exactly. responses as well. This does everything that we want a vaccine to do. So this really has a, a very good chance. Absolutely. Uh, that was Ian asked that question, so I think that was a really good answer okay. to, to Ian. Sorry, it takes me a little while to find them. There, there, there's some fantastic questions here, and I'll probably find the names of them after I've asked the questions. There have been several people asking really interesting questions about recruitment to trial and the population will eventually use the vaccine in. So um, one person was asking about what about people that have underlying autoimmune conditions? And another one asked about what about people that have, for example, thymectomy or something like that? Are, 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 are these sorts of vaccines appropriate or suitable for those, or do we already know anything about uh, anything about them? Um... Yes, yes, they are, because it's although it's live, it's replication deficient. It can't spread in the body. So it's a safe type of vaccine to use. Um, so in the phase one study and then the phase two in the older adults, we screen people uh, to be in, in very good health for, as the first population to be vaccinated. Uh, and we've, that's been happening. And then in the phase three trial, um, we don't do such extensive screening. So um, in the phase three trial, we're recruiting people who don't have um, terminal illnesses, really. Um, you know, as long as they are um, able to give consent to take part in the vaccine trial and they're not chronically, um, they don't have some really extremely severe illness, um, then they will be recruited in the trial. So we will have people with a number of different uh, pre-existing conditions in the trial, and that's not part of the screening criteria. Right. We are prioritizing people who don't have antibodies to the coronavirus already, because yes. um, so we're, we're testing to see if they've already got antibodies before we recruit, because if they already have antibodies, they may work, we don't know, but they may well be protected against another infection anyway, and then that would help us with our efficacy results. No, absolutely, absolutely. That was Vicky that asked that question. Um, okay. So, so, so uh, then uh, uh, Jibby asks um, an interesting question, because the same vector, the Chadox uh, vector, can be used for a variety of things like the mening, like the flu and so on. Um, what what would be the impact if you've already been immunized with a vaccine with this backbone? Is, is it gonna stop you being able to be immunized 
with this new the, the new content because of the backbone being the same? No, because remember that um, again the the virus doesn't make more copies of itself. It doesn't replicate after we've used right. it as a as a vaccine vector. So if you've had an adenovirus infection giving you a cold, that yeah. And the virus has made lots of copies of itself. It's spread through the body and your immune system has to make antibodies to defeat it and stop the infection. But that's not the case with our viral vector. We just give it and um, you have the first cell that gets infected is the last cell that gets infected and you don't have it spreading. So we've measured anti-vector antibodies um, in people who've had the vaccine. And we've looked at the impact of, of that in right. preclinical studies of giving a second dose of the vaccine. Yep. And we see that we get a very strong immune response to the second dose of the vaccine, even though there are anti-vector antibodies, right. because they're not present at very high levels. So, you know, I wouldn't recommend using Chadox-1 for every single vaccine. That it you would gradually to build up, wouldn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because over, you know, if, if you had five vaccinations in exactly. a year, you might be building up your immunity. But um, Given that we tend to vaccinate at you know quite long intervals between for different vaccines, I don't see it's likely to be a problem. No, that's 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 great, and and, and a good reason for using the non-replication competent vector, isn't it? Um, now, a couple of questions, the sort of final sorts of ones are uh, ones I um, I think are quite interesting. One is about antigenic variation. Um, so so to what extent? Because obviously with flu, you mm -hmm. you're got you're chasing a a virus that's constantly changing antigenically. Is that a, 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 a significant challenge do you see for vaccines against the, this new coronavirus? No, it really doesn't seem to be. So with MERS coronavirus, it's been around for quite a number of years now, uh, and it exists in different species, uh, in different countries. And when we did our MERS vaccine trial, we actually looked at the ability of the antibodies produced by our vaccine to neutralize viruses from different species, different countries, different years, and it worked very well against all of them, because actually there isn't very much genetic variation. So yeah. the people who like, the epidemiologists who want to track the course of a virus through a population, talk about um, the mutations accumulating and being able to see where they go, but they're really very small number of yeah, mutations. Tiny, aren't they? Mm. And they, they don't appear to affect the ability of antibodies to yeah. bind or T cells to respond to them. So this might be different, this coronavirus is spreading around the world and, and infecting large numbers of people. So over time, we might see more genetic variation, but it's certainly not something that we see with the other ones. Yeah. I mean, in fact, in some ways, it's an ideal target in for your, for your, for your approach, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, then Fiona and Peter asked different versions of the same question, uh, which is about how long the immunity lasts. And I did notice in your graph on the MERS, there's a slight tail off, isn't there, after, after a year or something like that of neutralizing antibody. Well, is that, is, that, so is, that, is that the right interpretation? There's there's a decline from the peak of the response, yeah. and by about um, eight eight weeks to six months after vaccination, it's less than it was. But then it stays at that same level out to a year. Right. So you look, so having you know you get a very strong response straight after vaccination, that drops off a bit, but then it seems to carry on at the same level. Yeah. Uh, and in other trials that we've done, we've seen that going on for several years. Right. So. We'll have to wait and see. We'll be having lots of people vaccinated and hopefully be able to follow them, some mm. of them quite long term to, to get the answer. But I mean, we expect that it, it will last for, for, a, for a good couple of years um, and it may last better than immunity that you get from natural infection because coronaviruses don't seem to leave very much immune memory behind. No. Um, no. We know that people get repeatedly reinfected with the other human coronaviruses. Mm. Um, I think it's really interesting to look at the, the mechanism for that, which is not something we've really been able to do yet. And it may be something that's not the same when you use these viral vectors. So that's a, another research question. Really, that really is interesting. Um, actually, Peter has a sort of follow up on that about revaccination, the prime boost. I suppose that's the logic behind your double dose small arm of the trial, isn't it? Whether if you need to come back after a, a year or two, whether you get a nice anamnestic type response or, or, or something. Yeah. Yeah, so we, you know, we, we don't know if we need one dose or two. We think one dose is probably going to be good enough, but we're just getting the information about what can you achieve with two. And we know from the flu vaccine trials that I did, it doesn't really matter what the gap between those two doses is. You get pretty much the same boosting effect wow. if you give it That's eight handy. weeks or a year. You can come back a year later and it still boosts very well. Well, Sarah, that's a fantastic roundup of the, uh, of the research. And uh, can I thank you on behalf of... Um, of, of the enormous audience we've got today for, for that really, really lucid 
account and being able to answer those questions so 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 clearly. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and as as Sarah said at the beginning of her talk, there's a uh, and as you'll have noticed, you've been following these COVID conversations. A very wide range of researchers in Oxford working on antiviral drugs as well as vaccines, as well as immune response and so on. Um, and you're you're welcome to 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 drop in and look at those other conversations. Uh, that have already gone on. If you'd like to be uh, part of the uh, a part of the efforts, there are links in the uh, in the screen uh, below us right now where you can get involved and, and contribute to the uh, to the ongoing work, which will be uh, very uh, gratefully received. Um, with, this is not the last of the COVID conversations. There's plenty more to talk about. Next week we have a session on mental health in uh, in the coronavirus pandemic. I hope you have time to tune in then. Um, and until then, thank you very much for watching and goodbye.